Okay, so let's get started with chapter 23. This is the chapter on ray optics. So here we're going to try to understand and apply the ray model of light. So a light ray is a line along in the direction along which light energy is flowing. So if you have a narrow little beam of light, such as a laser beam, it's actually a, a bundle of many parallel light rays. They're going in this direction. You can think of a single light ray as the limiting case of a laser beam whose diameter uh, gets smaller and smaller. So what do light rays do? Well, they travel through transparent material in straight lines called rays. The speed of light is c over n, where c is the speed of light in a vacuum, and n is called the index of refraction of the material. It's a dimensionless number that's greater than 1. Light rays do not interact with one another, so if two rays go through the same point, they just cross without affecting each other in any way. Light rays interact with matter in four ways. So if there's an interface between two materials, material 1 and material 2, and they have different indices of refraction, then the light ray can either be reflected or it can be refracted. Reflected means bouncing back into the first material, and refracted means getting transmitted into the second material. Also, just within a material, a light ray can be scattered, which means it suddenly changes its direction, or it can be absorbed, which means that its energy uh, is, goes away and gets uh, sucked into the material somehow. An object is a source of light rays. So here's a Christmas tree. Rays originate from every point on this tree every, and sends light, light rays in all directions. And in order to see an object, you, your eye is over here. There's a diverging bundle of rays from, say, the top of this tree. Uh, it goes into the lens of your eye, and then that diverging bundle converges to a point on the retina on the back of your eye. And that's the top of the tree. From down here at the bottom of the tree, there's another diverging bundle of rays, which goes through the lens of your eye, and then focuses on this part of your retina. So, And this happens for every single point in the tree, so that you end up with an upside-down image that your brain uh, flips and interprets as, being, as, as uh, seeing the tree. So objects are either self-luminous, such as the sun or flames or maybe this screen that you're watching this video on, or they're reflective. Most objects you look at are reflective, like this tree. If you're going to take a picture of the tree, uh, what you do is you see the light rays that are reflected by the tree, but you don't want to get the sun in there. But in fact, it is sunlight reflected off the tree that allows you to see the tree. Remember that rays originate from every point on an object and travel outward in all directions. Uh, so there's a lot of rays, but uh, to simplify the picture, we use a ray dry diagram which only sh shows a few of the rays that we're interested in. A camera obscura is a darkened room or a box with a small hole in it called an aperture that light can go through. And this, uh, sometimes it's called a, a pinhole camera, but what it does is it makes an upside-down image on the back wall of the, of the box that's just created by the geometry. So here's a tree, light uh, f emerges from the tree and in all directions, but only the light that's going from here through this hole can make it to the, to the uh, back wall of the of the box and so you get this you end up with this nice upside down image and the height of the image h sub i uh, is related to the uh, height of the actual object h i over h o is equal to d i over d o where d i is the distance from the pinhole to the back of the box and d o is the distance from the front of the box to the object specular reflection Specular reflection is just reflection of light from a very smooth surface like a mirror. So all the uh, incoming bundle of parallel rays uh, get reflected and are also parallel. 
and specular reflection obeys the law of reflection, which is that the incident ray and the reflected ray are in the same plane, normal to the surface, and the angle of reflection equals the angle of incidence. So if you draw it uh, and you measure angles from the normal, where the normal is just a perpendicular uh, line from the surface, then this angle equals this angle. In diffuse reflection, uh, the surface on a, mic a microscopic level is rough, which means that an incoming parallel bundle of rays uh, get uh, scattered around when they're reflected so that they're no longer parallel. This uh, surface is rough, and this is called diffuse reflection. In fact, most objects are seen because of diffuse reflection of light on their surface. It's how we would see, for example, writing on a piece of paper, or the wall, or your hand, or your friend, or so on. You've got some light coming from some source, like the lights in the room, or the sun, and then it diffusely reflects off that surface, and some of these rays are bound to make it into your eye. Okay, image formation in a mirror. So, if you have an object P here, and these rays uh, reflect specularly off the surface of a plane mirror, then what your eye does is imagine that these rays that it receives are coming from a point beyond the mirror, and this is called a virtual image. Uh, your eye imagines that the light is actually coming from uh, point P prime, and the distance from uh, P prime to the mirror surface is S prime, and that's equal to the distance of the actual object from the plane mirror, S. S prime equals S for a plane mirror. Okay, so remember, your eye intercepts only a very small fraction of the reflected rays. And not only are these rays diverging so that we can estimate the distance to the, to the point, but also when they come from different parts of the object, those points are imaged onto different parts of your eye, which is how you form the image of the tree on your retina. Refraction. So when you have uh, two transparent materials with different indices of refraction, then and you shine a beam of light on that uh, on that boundary, part of the light reflects from the boundary, obeying the law of reflection, and part of the light continues into the second medium. And this transmitted light is uh, is uh, changes its direction, and this is called refraction. So uh, let's explore this a little bit with a, an animation that there's a link to below. So here we have a little flash animation. I have a link to this below, uh, which shows uh, a ray of light starting in the air, which passes into glass. And what happens is that some of the light, a little bit, is reflected off the glass, and some of it is transmitted down, most of it is transmitted down into the glass. And you can vary the angle of incidence uh, with this, if you take it down to zero, then the ray goes straight down into the glass, and you can't see the reflected ray, but it just goes straight back up. And then as you increase theta, you have angle of reflection always equals the angle of incidence. And then there's the angle of refraction, which you find uh, from Snell's law. And when you're going from a fast medium down into a slow medium, this ray always bends toward the normal meaning that the angle of refraction is less than the angle of incidence. And how much less depends on the index of refraction of the glass, which you can vary. Uh, if it goes larger, then there's a larger bending angle. If it goes smaller, then the bending angle of this ray is less. Uh, the next scene shows the ray starting in the glass and going up out into the air. So this is uh, called internal refraction. In this case, uh, you still have the, uh, if you go straight through, we just go, uh, there's zero angle of incidence, zero angle of refraction. Uh, the reflected ray goes straight back down, you can't see it. As you increase the angle of incidence, the angle of reflection is equal to the angle of incidence, but the angle of refraction is now greater. So when you're going from a slow medium to a fast medium, the ray bends away from the normal. And this actually means that there's a maximum angle whoops, somewhere here. In this case, for n equals 1.5, it looks like the angle of, if the angle of incidence is greater than 41 degrees, then 
the refracted angle, actually, there is no solution for it. It can't, uh, it goes greater than 90 degrees. And so what happens is that this, there is no refracted ray. All of the energy goes into reflected light. And that's called total internal reflection. So for any angle from 42 all the way up to 90, uh, there's no refracted ray there. And actually, that changes if you change the index or refraction of the, uh, of the glass. Well, let's see here. If we take this down. If the index or the refraction of, the, of glass is less, then this uh, critical angle is actually more. Now it's up at, uh, if we take this down to 1.25, the angle of an incidence beyond which its total internal reflection goes up to about, looks like about 52 there. Okay, so here is a table, uh, table 23.1, showing different transparent materials and their index of refraction. So for a vacuum, the de by definition, that has index of refraction 1. Uh, air, the air in this room, has index of refraction 1.0003. So to even four significant figures, uh, air and vacuum have the same uh, index of refraction. So we just, we would say to three sig figs, air has index of refraction 1. Water has index of refraction 1.33. So uh, light travels 33% slower in water than it does in air, which is why light bends when it goes into to water. And there's all these different indices. You can see diamond and silicon have very high indices of refraction, greater than, greater than 2, in fact. And as we showed in the animation, when a light ray goes from uh, uh, an external medium, where, where the, light, the speed is fast, down to a slower medium, then the ray has a kink at the boundary where it bends. And here is Snell's law. N1 uh, times sine theta 1 equals N2 times sine theta 2, where N2 is the uh, index refraction in medium 1. Sorry, N1 is the index of refraction in medium 1. N2 is the index of refraction in medium 2. Uh, theta 1 is the angle of incidence, and theta 2 is the angle of refraction. And if you reverse this ray, you get the same thing going in the opposite direction. Uh, here now, theta 2 is the angle of incidence, and theta 1 is the angle of refraction. This is where we have the light actually starting in medium 2. But it's the same exact equation. The ray direction is reversed. The incident and refracted angles are interchanged, but the values of theta 1 and theta 2 remain the same. Total internal reflection, which we also saw in the animation, uh, comes from the fact that when a ray crosses a boundary into a material with a lower index of refraction, it bends away from the normal, and this can only continue until theta 2 is equal to 90 degrees. And you can solve this out uh, since uh, sine of 90 degrees is 1, you can find uh, theta sub c, the critical angle, is, uh, is equal to inverse sine of n2 divided by n1, where n2 is less than n1 here. So at this, at this angle and beyond this angle, the, there is no refracted ray, and all of the light is, is just reflected. And the most important modern application of total internal reflection is optical fibers. Here we have a laser shining light into a glass fiber, and when it uh, impinges on the inside wall of the glass, where there's air outside or some lower index of refraction material outside, then all of the light is reflected and it just keep, continues to uh, bounce its way down the tube as if it were in a pipe. So this is like a light pipe. And here it could be your, your detector down here. And in practical optical fiber that we use in communications, you have a core, a small glass core that's surrounded by a cladding that has a lower index of refraction than the core. And then there's some uh, plastic protective cover so that if people step on it or something, it doesn't, it doesn't break the glass. And of course, you must have n core greater than n cladding in order for uh, the total internal reflection to happen uh, inside the core. So image formation. So let's think of just looking at an object. What happens is the bundle of ray comes out, uh, hits, the, hits the lens of your eye, and then is focused onto the retina of, uh, of your eye. So the rays are diverging from the object. If the fish is in an aquarium, then these rays, when they go uh, from the water out into the air, I guess there might be a little thin glass barrier there, but we're ignoring the glass, uh, 
they're going to bend away from the normal. So if they go straight through, they'll go straight through. If they're up a little bit, then they'll bend a little more up. If they are down a little bit, they'll bend a little more down to bend away from the normal. And so these diverging rays now appear to be diverging from this image. The image of the fish we see is a little closer. So, and then, then there's this uh, new uh, depth D prime. The distance we think the fish is is closer than the distance that the fish actually is. So you can solve out for this. Rays emerge from a material uh, with n1 greater than n2. Uh, if we consider a para paraxial rays for which theta1 and theta2 are pretty small, then we can solve that s prime, the distance from the, the surface of the water, or whatever it is, to uh, the image, p prime, uh, is equal to s, the distance to the actual object, times n2 over n1. Okay, dispersion. So a prism disperses light, white light, into various colors. So here we have, it's drawn purple, but this is supposed to be a beam of white light. If it goes through a prism, then it can split this light or disperse the light into all the colors of the rainbow. Uh, but of course, so it's just changing the, so the white light already has all these colors and they're just coming out with different directions. If you start with a particular, particular color, like green light, then the second prism changes the direction, but doesn't split the green light into any component colors. So all the different colors are associated with different wavelengths. So longest wavelengths are like red, shortest wavelengths are violet. You have the whole Roy G. Biv, Biv going through and decreasing uh, wavelength. And if you combine all the colors together, you get white light. White light is, a, uh, is what we perceive as the mixture of all colors. So dispersion is the slight variation of the index of refraction of a material uh, depending on wavelength. So here is a dispersion curve where you plot wavelength of light versus index of refraction. And we've these, there's two curves shown here, one for flint glass and one for crown glass, which is just two different kinds of glass. And so flint glass has a larger index of refraction than crown glass, but for both cases, uh, n is larger when the wavelength is shorter. Okay, so uh, light travel, purple light travels slower in the glass than red light. And one of the most interesting sources of color in nature is the rainbow, which is caused by the dispersion of light in water. So when sunlight comes along and it strikes a little spherical suspended droplet of water, then it will uh, disperse in there. So first, the sunlight, which is sun is behind your back when you see a rainbow, it disperses into uh, the little droplet. And so it splits out into uh, red orange, yellow, green, blue, violet, into different angles. Then when it hits the other side of the droplet, most of the light uh, goes back out into the air, but a little bit reflects back into the drop and then disperses back out. And then you see uh, a little bit of reflected sunlight, but now it looks like, uh, looks like a little rainbow because different angles are, or different colors are coming from different angles. And here's a picture I took while riding on Bloor Street. Of, of a rainbow and what's happening is the sun is behind my back now and there's lots of little suspended spherical droplets in the air here and they are uh, dispersing and then reflecting the light back into my eyes. And you can see red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet are coming from slightly different angles. So here's a piece of green glass. It is green because it absorbs any light that is not green and then reflects or transmits light that is green. And here's a red piece of glass, a red filter, which uh, transmits light uh, that is red, but absorbs any light that is not red. So if you overlap a red filter and a green filter, it'll absorb everything and you just get black. Okay, so this green filter transmits only light that's green, uh, and then that light is absorbed by the red filter because it's not red. Here we see a bunch of leaves uh, in my backyard, and down here we see the absorption curve of chlorophyll, which is in all of these leaves. 
And so chlorophyll absorb, absorbs a lot of uh, blue light. It absorbs a lot of red light uh, for photosynthesis. But it, would, but it doesn't use the, the green light. It just reflects that away. The chemical reactions absorb out the red and the, and, and the blue violet light and uh, creates energy and sugars inside the plant but it just reflects away the green light because it doesn't need it. So when you look at green leaves on a tree, you're seeing the light that was reflected because it wasn't needed for photosynthesis. So this shy slide shows the link between blue skies and red sunsets. So when sunlight, which is a mixture of all the different colors, so white, white light, uh, when it travels through air, the light can scatter from small particles like the air molecules that are suspended. And this is called Rayleigh scattering from atoms and molecules, which depends on the fourth power of wavelength. It's inverse of the fourth power of the wavelength. So as you get to uh, higher, uh, sorry, longer wavelengths like red, then it's less likely to be scattered than for bluer wavelengths, which is, are more likely to be scattered. So that is why the sky is blue, is this observer at midday will see more, tend to see more sc uh, scattered blue light than scattered red light. Okay, but this observer at sunset, who is looking through a whole lot of air towards the sun, which is right down on the horizon, will see the light coming from the sun minus all this blue light that's been scattered out for the uh, to make everyone else's blue sky. And so it'll end up being more red. So here's a nice red sunset. The sun's going through lots and lots of air. And this red light is what's left over when all the people um, in different parts of the earth are getting uh, their blue sky.